pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Collins, the director of the Human Genome Project. He grew up in Shenandoah Valley in Stanton, Virginia on a 95-acre farm. He went to the University of Virginia and majored in chemistry because he found biology boring. He doesn't eat breakfast or lunch, but his favorite dessert is Boston cream pie. He also plays acoustic guitar. Dr. Collins went to Yale and earned a PhD in quantum mechanics, and then later discovering he wanted to work with people, he went to medical school at the University of North Carolina. Dr. Collins then went on to learn how to be a genetic researcher and found it to be a perfect fit. He says then that he got a real job as a faculty member at Michigan and found the gene that causes cystic fibrosis in 1989. Dr. Collins became the director of the Human Genome Project in 1993. He then began his work at the National Institute of Health in Maryland, which he rides his motorcycle to. And in the last three weeks, he has had personal conversations with Clinton, Bono, Kissinger, and Karzai. Bono. So everyone, Dr. Collins. Thank you, Nicole. That was very well done. Nice to be introduced by somebody from my own state of Maryland. And it's great to be here with all of you. I grew up about two hours from here. I uh, visited my parents last night and drove over here to this beautiful setting. Took a little walk in the woods, uh, slipped a little bit, ran into a few spider webs I wasn't expecting, but it was still delightful. <laughs> uh, it's a real treat to be here. Last year, some of the people at the camp traveled to NIH. And so I had a half an hour or so to talk to about a third. Uh, of the delegates. Uh, this year they suggested, why don't I come here instead? And it sounded like a good idea to me. So I'm really happy to be here. And what I'm going to do is to give you a bit overview of where we are with the Human Genome Project, which I'm going to argue is about the most significant scientific undertaking of an organized sort that humankind has ever mounted. So this is pretty serious stuff. I'm going to try to project where it's going to take us in medicine and in its societal implications, because there are going to be lots of those too. And, and I'll get into some of those bioethical issues, because I think you all are probably pretty interested in those. And I think we can probably discuss those uh, quite usefully. So then we'll have time for some discussion. And then there's a little bit of a stupid surprise at the end, and we'll find out what that is when we get there. Uh, so here we go. And um, again, I'm hoping at the end of all this, we can have a vigorous discussion, because I gather from what I've heard that you all are not shocked. And that's good. And by the way, I'm going to be here at breakfast and at lunch tomorrow. So if you have other questions that didn't get answered tonight, uh, come and find me, and uh, we'll have it out. And I hope, by the way, that a lot of you will, at some point in your scientific careers, decide that working on the next steps of what we can learn from the human genome is something you want to be involved in, because this is going to be an incredible adventure. And the adventure is really just starting. How many of you, just out of curiosity, uh, imagine that you might be interested in going to medical school? Jeez, a bunch of docs. Okay, well, I'm a doc, so I'll talk to you about that later if you want to know what you're in for. Uh, how many of you are uh, sort of focused, if you had to pick an area of science that you're interested in, uh, you would pick biological as opposed to, say, physical or engineering. Biological science? Ooh, a lot of you. Okay. And by the way, I thought biology was boring. I was wrong about that. It's not. <laughs> it's incredibly interesting. Okay, so here we go. So I know you get to see this stuff up on the screen, and I'm not supposed to stand in the way of it. I don't know. Well, you know DNA, right? I don't have to tell you much about this. This is this incredible molecule that carries information for all living things. We are coming up on the 50th anniversary next spring of when Watson and Crick published their famous one-page paper on April 25th, 1953, where they described the double helix structure of DNA. And that really changed everything. But of course, at that point, uh, I know Jim Watson pretty well. He was my predecessor and the first director of the Genome Project. I stepped in after he uh, decided that he wasn't going to continue that in 1992. He got in a fight with his boss, actually. Uh, and. If you ask Jim Watson or Francis Crick, they're both still alive. Did you imagine in 1953, when you uncovered the double helix structure of human DNA, that in your lifetime we would actually read that entire script for human beings? 
They would say, absolutely not. They didn't think that would happen in 300 years. And yet, essentially, in the last two years, we've done that. We have the three billion letters, base pairs, of the human DNA sequence essentially complete. We have about another nine months worth of cleanup to do. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But for the most part, any question you want to ask of the human DNA sequence, you can now ask because it's there on the internet for you to go and look at. I'll give you a URL in a bit if you haven't gone to look at it, where you can go and have a look for yourself and see what it looks like. So this is a pretty amazing moment in history. We have crossed over a threshold from not knowing our own instruction book to knowing it. And I think instruction book's a pretty good metaphor for what the genome is. It's written in this funny language that has only four letters in its alphabet, E, C, G, and T. But it's a linear string of letters. If you printed those letters out on pages of average thickness, of font size of the sort of usual sort, and you bound them together into volumes and you stack them on top of each other, they would be as high as the Washington Monument. And you carry that inside each cell of your body. All 100 trillion cells that you've got is carrying around a Washington Monument worth of information. Pretty amazing system. But in another way, it's amazing that it's enough. Because that instruction book, those three billion letters, have to be sufficient to take you from being a one-celled embryo, which you all once were, to where you are right now, with all of the amazing things that the human body can do. And in that regard, three billion doesn't seem like nearly enough. But it must be, because it works. Well, it works most of the time. Because with three billion letters, things go wrong. When you're copying that every time the cell divides, or when a parent is passing that book on to a child, mistakes get made. All of us uh, are carrying around some glitches. Do you want to know yours? No. This is an interesting question, because you're going to have the chance to find out in about 10 years what your own set of glitches are. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to begin to think about whether you want to sign up for that information or not. If tomorrow morning included an option where you could sequence your own genome, and they'd give you the results and say, well, I'm sorry about this one. You probably didn't want to hear that, but you're going to get this disease or that problem. How many of you would have signed up for that option? Okay, good. Somebody wants to know this. I think there's a lot of reason to know this information. Could be very interesting. Could be very valuable. We're going to get into that. Now, I know somebody was here earlier at camp talking about maple syrup urine disease, uh, a very interesting rare disease that occurs particularly in the Amish, but also occurs in some other populations as well. It is a rare disease that happens particularly in a circumstance where there's a lot of inbreeding, so that it's a recessive disease. Both parents have to be carriers in order for the disease to occur. A lot of people tend to think of genetics as those kinds of disorders. But in fact, that is far too narrow a view. If you came here thinking that genetics is just the study of Huntington's disease and maple syrup urine disease and cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia, well, that isn't really the whole story at all. Virtually every disease except maybe if you get hit by a brick walking down the street, uh, you have some hereditary predisposition that folds into this. Now, don't get me wrong, because people in here who are very interested in studying the environment may stand up and say, wait a minute, the environment is really important in risk of disease. And you're right, it's incredibly important. But most diseases come about because of a mix of a hereditary susceptibility and some environmental exposure or a trigger that kind of work together in the wrong way to cause the disease. And that would be true of diabetes, or cancer, or heart disease, or mental illness, or asthma, or a long list of common conditions. So think right now, what runs in your family? What does your sort of family history here tell you about what you might be at risk for because of what your parents, your aunts and uncles, your grandparents, other relatives may have already been affected with? And there's a fair chance that that's saying that somewhere in your 3 billion base fears, there's a little glitch that may make you also at risk for that. Again, you might want to know that. If there was something you could do about it, you might not be so interested if it was just, have a nice day, you're going to get Alzheimer's disease. So <laughs> it would be good to connect this with an intervention. The second bullet here, I'm sorry because this is National Youth Science Camp. There are spectacular people in this room. But I'm sorry to tell you that none of you are perfect specimens. If you thought you were coming here, Ah, sorry. At least at the level of your DNA sequence, there are some screw-ups. And uh, that's the way it is for all of us. And uh, that's probably the way it will stay. Okay. Now, the Human Genome Project 
got started in 1990, a dozen years ago, because people like me and a whole bunch of scientists around the world decided that the technology just might be up to the task of reading out those three billion letters. Now, that was a pretty bold assessment, because in 1990, you'd be doing good if you could read a thousand of them in one day. That was really quite an achievement. You could almost get a PhD for that. And to do the Genome Project, where we claimed we were going to read all three billion letters in one organized effort, we had to sequence a thousand base pairs a second. And we had to do that seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So the scale up here, in terms of the magnitude, was pretty daunting. But you know, until you start, you never know how hard it's going to be. So what it required was an organized effort, and it required a thoughtful laying out of what the steps would need to be in order to achieve this. You didn't want to just start sequencing chromosome 1 on the first day of the genome project, because our technology was woefully inadequate. You'd never get there. So we had to first spend the first five or six years getting the technology better, automating a lot of the steps that used to be manual, building these maps that you see on here. These maps were basically putting mile markers along the chromosome. So at least you had the general anatomy, sort of the view from 30,000 feet of the genome before you go in and start trying to count every blade of grass. And that was very successful, and that enterprise accomplished its goals on schedule. And then in 1996, we began, began to try to see whether we could actually do the sequencing part, the reading out of all those A, C's, G's, and T's. By then, we practiced on bacteria and on yeast, genomes that are much smaller. And it looked as if, well, we're probably getting into the right ballpark. But those first couple of years of sequencing human DNA, you can see the curve didn't go up too fast. And then things really started to work. The original goal was to get the sequence of the human genome by 2005. And as I said at the beginning, we're essentially there. So this got moved forward. And that's a good thing. A project of this sort, one expects, will run over schedule and the budget will get completely blown away. Well, this federally funded project, I'm glad to tell you, is ahead of schedule and under budget. It has been so from day one. And that's a testimony to the people who worked on it. So who worked on this? Who did this? Well, my job at the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, is to direct the National Human Genome Research Institute, which has as its goals these various milestones. But this is an international project. It happens the United States has the largest investment, which means effectively I'm supposed to be the guy to coordinate all this. But the United Kingdom and Germany, Germany's here, and France and Japan and China all have a significant role in this as well. There have been about 2,500 people working on this project for the sequencing part, the part that's been taking up the last three or four years. So 2,500 people in six countries, and it's sort of up to me to try to coordinate all of that, which means making sure that everybody understands what the expectation is about which part of the genome this center is doing about how good the quality has to be. We don't want to produce a junky genome sequence that gets everybody mixed up. And what the milestones have to be, and what happens if somebody misses a milestone, how do we shuffle territory around so it all gets done. And that's actually been enormous fun, because the people doing this are some of the best and brightest scientists of our generation who migrated into the Genome Project because of their sense of how incredibly historical this is, this reading our own instruction book. You only do this once. And now, you know, we kind of did it. And these people all got a chance to be part of it. That's pretty exciting. Well, the sequencing really kicked off uh, at a steep slope here in about uh, 99. And by the summer of 2000, we had essentially covered 90% of the DNA sequence in a draft form, a draft that still had gaps that have to be closed, in places where we weren't absolutely sure, is that a T or is that a C? We'd better go back and check. Uh, but that was a big moment because we could say that essentially most of the information was in hand. And you may have noticed some hoo-ha in the press at that point because it was a big public announcement with President Clinton in the White House linked up with Prime Minister Blair at uh, number 10 Downing Street. And I got to go stand next to the president and make this announcement along with Craig Venter, who is the director of a private sector effort to sequence the human genome at a company called Celera. How many of you heard about the so-called race to sequence the human genome. You've heard about this. Well, let me tell you a little about the race. Uh, that's a very interesting chapter in the scheme of things. It was a race that wasn't, because there were very different aspects to what was happening. The public project, this thing that I was supposed to be leading, 
had agreed way back at the beginning in 1996 that all of our data would go up on the internet every 24 hours. So we gave our information away as fast as we could because we thought that was the best way to make sure that it got used to good advantage. And I think that's paid off very nicely because any scientist with an internet connection started working with it right away. And already I can point to about 50 diseases where we know now what the genetic problem is because people were able to use the sequence. So that was one of our principles. The other was that we would not patent any of this information. We felt that this was fundamental basic information that was of such broad and general utility that it shouldn't be patented. You shouldn't put fences around parts of the genome and ask people to pay royalties to work with that. So all of this was put into the public domain. Now the private sector effort, of course, couldn't afford to do that. They were spending about a half a billion dollars of private money. So of course, they had to make a profit, which meant they couldn't give their data away, and they were essentially obligated to file patents. And they filed something like 60,000 patents on, on human genes in the process of hoping to recover some of their investment. They also used a somewhat different strategy uh, for sequencing the genome. And this gets a little technical, and I'm not going to trouble you with it, but it was a fundamentally different approach. And that was useful because we were able to make a comparison when the dust all settled about how the approaches had worked. And I think effectively there were good things to be said about both approaches, but actually the public project is probably the only one that could be finished. That is, it could go to a draft, and then it could go on and finish the job, which is what we're now in. Uh, the private sector approach didn't give you a product that effectively could be finished. It would have been a draft uh, for all time. So that's a little background on all that. But you know what? Uh, the most important moment uh, for the perspective of the scientists working on this was not going to the White House and making a big media announcement. It was publishing a paper saying, we sequenced the human genome, and this is what we learned from it. And that happened about a year ago in this issue of Nature magazine. Uh, the public project uh, published their data, and then Science magazine, uh, the Solera investigators published theirs, and we both tried to analyze what we had seen. And interestingly, a lot of similarities were noted in terms of the lessons that one could learn from this. Now, you probably can't tell unless you're sitting very close. Uh, we worked very hard on the symbolism of this cover uh, of nature because we wanted to pick something that would convey what this was all about. So, of course, you'll recognize the double helix, but if you look closely, it's really a mosaic, and it's made up of the faces of people from all over the world, of every kind of gender and dress, ethnicity, age, uh, and all sort of cobbled together. It's image, because that's really what this was about. This wasn't just a science project on an organic chemical called DNA. This is about us. It's about all of us. Your DNA and my DNA are 99.9% .9 the same. And that doesn't matter which one of you I pick. That would still be true. We are a remarkably young species with remarkably similar DNA sequences. So when you sequence the genome, well, it's pretty important to everybody. Now, people always ask, okay, then whose genome did you actually sequence? Well, we thought long and hard about this. Obviously, there was no perfect genome, because nobody has one of those, so we couldn't sort of pick a gold standard. Whatever genome we sequence is going to have some glitches in it. And we thought it was pretty important that whoever's genome it was shouldn't end up having that used against them. Would you want it to be yours up there on the internet? for the whole world to look at and go, oh, <laughs> did you see what Jane has there in base pair 3,290? <laughs> maybe we shouldn't uh, give her that job, or maybe she shouldn't be admitted to our college. Uh, so we want to protect the identity of the donors. So we put out an ad in a newspaper on the East Coast, and a bunch of people answered the ad saying they were interested in being a volunteer for this. And they came in and got a full explanation of what the benefits and risks were. There were about 100 of them, and they were diverse in their ethnicity and their gender. And we took blood samples from all of them, and we made DNA from all of those blood samples, and then we pulled the labels off. And we only used five of them. Now, we don't know which five we used. We know there were boys and girls in there, because we could tell that pretty quickly by looking at the Y chromosome, whether it's there or not. But we do not know who the actual individuals were whose genome sequence was used, and we like it that way a lot. Uh, and I think that was the right way to do it. Now, interestingly, the, the uh, sequence that was produced by Solera was supposedly of the same sort. Uh, they also had a mix of individuals. But it was just revealed that about three months ago that the person who ran the company, uh, Dr. Venter, apparently was overcome with curiosity. And so he rather subverted the process so that most of the sequence that Solera produced was that of Dr. Venter. 
himself, which uh, is both amusing and a little disturbing in that uh, supposedly this was a process that was all very carefully anonymized, and some of the other people involved were pretty mad about that. Oh, well. If you want to know what's wrong with Craig Venter, uh, you have to buy a subscription to see his data because you can't just see it on the internet, but it might be worth uh, poking around. <laughs> now, we thought it would be fun uh, with our cover, this is just a little bit of uh, inside story here from science, uh, to try to uh, make a little joke out of this, and that is with a cover of that sort, it's very tempting to hide a picture in there of somebody important. And we decided, well, if anybody deserves to be hidden in this picture, it's Watson and Crick. You know, we're building on what they discovered almost 50 years ago. So somewhere on that cover, in one of those little squares, is the famous picture of Watson and Crick from 1953, admiring their double helix. And I'd be pretty sure with the poor resolution here that nobody, even in the front row, could find it. So I'll just save you the trouble and show you where it is. It's right down there. <laughs> now, there's one other scientist whose face we thought belonged on here. And that was Gregor Mendel, the monk, right? The guy who figured genetics out in the first place. So we put his picture in there, also hidden in a place, and we sent it off to nature for them to make the cover, not realizing that they were going to trim the margins. So all of Gregor Mendel that made it was his forehead. <laughs> right down there in the lower corner. You get an original of this, and you know what the famous photo of Mendel looks like, you'll recognize his forehead, but the rest of it is not apparent. <laughs> okay, so what did we learn from this? We did all this work. Were there any surprises? You know, one of my nightmares was that we do all this work for 10 years, and we look at the sequence, and we kind of go, kind of what I thought. Wouldn't that be a bummer? After all of this work, it's like, yeah, kind of what I thought. Well, no. Actually, there were a lot of surprises. A lot of really remarkable things that blew our socks off. And this is just a smattering of them. First of all, we discovered that we have a lot fewer genes than we expected. Genes, of course, is a stretch of DNA. It carries a particular instruction, codes for a particular protein, does some particular function. And people have been talking about, for 20 years, the 100,000 genes in the human genome. Of course, we didn't really know, but it was sort of a nice round number. And it sort of got into the textbooks, and we all kept saying it. And we didn't really quite know why we were saying it. And now we have the whole thing in front of us, and we can really get the answer. And it is disturbing to realize how far off we are. There's only about 30,000 genes in the human genome. Now, isn't that amazing? I mean, 30,000 instructions is all it takes to build a human being. That was particularly upsetting uh, when we began to look at genomes of other organisms and discovered that roundworms have 19,000 genes, <laughs> and a mustard weed has 25,000 genes. <laughs> and rice uh, that you probably had to eat while you've been here has 55,000 genes. <laughs> What's going on here? So clearly, just counting the number of genes is not a good measure of biological complexity. There must be more than that going on. Well, one of the things that's going on is this whole history of one gene makes one protein. Not anymore. Uh, one gene often makes about three or four proteins using this mechanism of alternative splicing. So maybe that gives us some sense of recovered pride, because we do that more than rice does. <laughs> so, at least at the protein counting level, uh, we're still looking okay, but who you knows, somebody may come along and knock us off the hill. We also uh, studied mutation rates, because we were curious to see, you know, mistakes happen. Uh, when DNA gets passed from parent to child, uh, who makes the mistakes more often? Well, it won't surprise the women here to learn <laughs> that it's the guys uh, who are sort of... Um, not, not as careful as they should be, copying their DNA and passing it on to the next generation. Uh, so we make mistakes about twice as often. Which means that, guys, we have to accept responsibility for two-thirds of genetic disease. It has to start somewhere, and two-thirds of the time it starts in us. <laughs> but you know what? It's not so bad. Because that means we can also claim complete credit for two-thirds of evolutionary progress. <laughs> right? It's the same thing. Mutations. Bad ones, good ones. You do them both. <laughs> we also learned to have more respect uh, for the part of the genome that we used to call junk, uh, which is the part that isn't making protein. It's not part of a gene. It's full of these repetitive sequences that we used to just think were annoying. Uh, remnants that are left over from transposable elements that leaked in and couldn't leap out, and that we haven't been able to get rid of.
actually pretty good evidence that there is something, something pretty useful. So I've taken the word junk out of my dictionary, at least when I'm talking about DNA. Now, if you want to look at the DNA, the genome, there's all sorts of websites that you can go and look at it. Uh, this is my favorite. This is the one the people in my lab at NIH use most often. It is actually a browser that was written and put up on the web by a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz, a, a rather remarkable guy named Jim Kent, who thought the other browsers were kind of clunky, so he just wrote his own. and incorporated all this data, because it's all public, and put it into this particular view. So you're looking right here at a stretch of chromosome 7, 7Q3.1.2, so it's a long arm of chromosome 7. Uh, this is telling you where there's a known gene here. It happens to be a cancer gene called MET. And then there are all these other tracks that tell you what else is there. And you can turn tracks on and off depending on what you're interested in looking at. You can zoom in all the way down to the base pair or zoom all the way out and look at a whole chromosome, whatever you want to do. You can move to the left, move to the right. You can click on any one of these things and you get a whole host of information about what that gene does and what we know about it. That's turning out to be really important. The computational aspect of genomics is fascinating. Those of you who are interested in computer science and also interested in biology, boy, is there a future for you. Because marrying those two together is going to be where a huge amount of interesting stuff is going to be happening over the next several decades. We have these huge databases now, but you need complicated algorithms in order to really figure out what's in there that's important to grasp as far as concept. Well, I said that this paper is coming up on its 50th anniversary, and it is. This is the Watson and Crick paper, at least the, the uh, one figure that comes from it. But I also stuck it in here to tell you that by next April 25th, 1953, uh, 2003, uh, we will have finished the sequence of the human genome. Not a draft anymore, done, finished, for all time. Uh, and so uh, we're on track to do that. And a big part of my job right now is riding herd on 16 centers in six countries to make sure that they're on track to finish their part of it. And in fact, we're very much on track. And I think we might even finish a month or two early, but I'm not willing to make that prediction. But we'll definitely be able to say, in next April, it's done. So there'll probably be a big fuss. You can count on, I think, some celebrations in the scientific community, and maybe even more broadly, that we got to this 50th anniversary, and we finished the genome. And it's done, and it's all available. And now we got to better get on with figuring out what it means. So how are we going to figure out what it means? If you just looked, if you went to the internet and started paging through this A, C, G, and T, it would be pretty overwhelming. So we need methods now to understand how the instructions work. And here are some of the things that people are now plunging into as the next phase of genome research. I don't have time to talk about any of them in any particular detail, but let me just quickly touch on a couple of things here. Functional genomics, what's that? Well, that's trying to figure out how genes work. Not just one gene at a time, but thousands of them at once. What you're looking at here is a DNA chip. This is about the size of a microscope slide. It allows you to look and see whether thousands of genes are turned on or off in a particular tissue, all in one quick experiment. The computational side is not so quick, but the laboratory side is quite quick. And so we need to figure out, how does this network of regulation work? So that your liver cell, which has the same DNA as your brain cell, doesn't use the genes in the same way. How does that work? And how does it get screwed up in, in various types of diseases that you'd want to understand in order to intervene? Proteomics is all the buzz. Proteomics basically means taking the same attitude that we took the DNA, which is trying to be complete. Not just looking at a little snapshot here and there, but look at everything at once and applying it to proteins. That's going to be really, really hard. Because as I said, one gene makes at least three proteins. And though those proteins also get modified by cleavages and glycosylations and phosphorylations and sulfurations, all of these things are going to happen, which are going to greatly complicate the problem. So you're going to end up with over a million proteins that have to be characterized. And if you really want to understand proteins, you got to worry about their three-dimensional structures, which I think somebody's talking about tomorrow morning. Because uh, you can think of DNA as a one-dimensional sort of script of information. And you're pretty close to right. Proteins don't mean anything until you start thinking about their shapes and where they are in the cell and what they interact with. So this is going to be important, but it's going to be really hard. But we better get on with it. What's this comparative genomics? Well, you know what? Having the sequence of a human is pretty exciting. But without something to compare it to, it's really hard to understand it. So we have now sequenced the mouse. I spent this weekend working on a big manuscript about how we're going to describe what we've learned from the mouse. It's fascinating. So about 1.5% of the mouse genome 
is so close to the human genome that you can immediately see how it lines up. And that 1.5% is mostly the genes. And then there's another 1.5% that lines up really well, too. And we don't know what it is, but it's probably pretty interesting. Maybe it has something to do with that regulation of what makes genes turn on and on. But even having two genomes isn't enough. Uh, we are now sequencing the rat. We just started sequencing the chimpanzee. Wouldn't you like to know what that 1.2% difference between us and them is all about? That's all it is. Chimpanzee is 98.8% .8 the same as us. So we're going to find out what that little difference is all about, although it's going to be fairly hard to interpret that, too. Uh, we're starting to sequence the chicken, because the chicken is a good model for a development. It's also good to eat, so the USDA is helping to pay for this. <laughs> uh, and uh, a bunch of other organisms, the sea urchin, a bunch of fungi, uh, it goes on. Sequencing is not something that's going to go away for a while. It's going to be with us, and that's good. But for me as a physician, maybe the part that I'm most interested in now is taking this information and bringing it to medicine. Because there are so many diseases that I don't really know how to cure. Neither does anybody else. We describe them. We have some idea what the symptoms are, what the natural history are. But we don't really understand what's going on at the molecular level. So our treatments are usually rather empirical, and they don't work nearly as well as we wish they would. So here's our chance to really understand what's at the bottom of those things. Now, some of that is going to be by understanding the part of the genome that's different between us, that 0.1%. This might be me. This comes from chromosome 7. If you didn't recognize it, some of you probably did. <laughs> now, that might be me, and that might be you. Two places there where we're different. There's about 2,000 letters of the DNA code there. Uh, and that's about the difference you'd expect, two out of 2,000. Most of those differences, I mean, you're having a T there. Are you worried about that? You probably don't need to be. Most of these differences are going to be in a part of the genome that isn't doing anything too critical. So you can get away with a little spelling variation, and it won't matter. But some small fraction is going to matter. It's going to make me at risk for diabetes, maybe, and you at risk for cancer. Right? We'd like to find out which those are and find them out quickly and then use that information to figure out, well, what is diabetes anyway, and what is cancer? And we're well on the way to doing that, because we have a catalog that's building very quickly of all those variations in all those genes. So the experiment that we would like to do, and maybe some of you will come and help us, because we'll be ready to do this in about three years, is to have all the variations in the human genome that are common amongst the species, and to do simply what you call a case control experiment where you have a bunch of people affected with the disease, let's say these people have diabetes, a bunch of people who aren't, and you look gene after gene after gene through all 30,000 genes at the variance in those genes to see whether there's a correlation. So here's a negative answer. No correlation there. Purple and green equally represented in the affected and the unaffected. But over here is a really interesting one, where the orange spelling seems to predispose to diabetes. And if you look through the whole genome, and that's the beauty of genomics, is you can look at the whole thing. You don't have to settle for a little snapshot here, a little snapshot there. You look at the whole thing. So you know the answer is going to be there. This is like a good detect story. You start at the beginning of the book. You know when you get to the last page, there's going to be an answer. Unless they played a really bad trick on you. <laughs> I don't want to read those stories. But you know along the way, you're going to get a lot of clues. And some of them are going to be right. And some of them are going to be false. And you're going to go down bad alleys. But at the end of the book, you're going to get an answer. That's what is so cool about genetics. You know there's an answer in there. And you know that if the tools are getting better and better. We're going to succeed at this. So I'm going to be bold and say that in the next 10 years, we will find the major contributing genes for diabetes, heart disease, cancer, mental illness, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, asthma, on down that list. We will find them. Maybe you'll come and help us. And actually, some of them are already getting found. 10 years is fairly conservative. Well, you might ask, so what? So we find the genes. How did that help anybody? Well, let's talk about that. What's the impact of all this going to be on the practice of medicine? For those of you who are interested in being doctors, how is genomics going to be part of your practice? For the rest of you who are probably going to be patients, whether you want to or not, <laughs> how is this going to affect the medical care that you're offering? Well, this takes a certain amount of projecting into the future, which is always a bit risky. And so before I project, I want to remind you that other people trying to project into the future have frequently been wrong. So you won't hold it against me if I'm wrong, too. Uh, a few examples. I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. So what idiot said that? Thomas Watson. Who was he? 
chairman of IBM. <laughs> so you might have known better. Well, it was 1943, after all. Uh, another projection. Concept is interesting and well formed, but in order to earn better than a C, the idea must be feasible. So this was written on a term paper that was given back to a student in the Yale Business School by a distinguished professor who clearly didn't like the student's term paper and thought that he had proposed a rather poor business plan. The student was a guy named Fred Smith, whose term paper proposed FedEx. <laughs> He went on to found FedEx, and obviously, although I guess a little glitch here this week, but up until now, he's been doing very well. All right, another. Uh, we don't know about that. Yeah, yeah, what's the glitch? Their stock went down, something happened, they didn't make their payments. It'll, it'll, it'll recover. Everybody's stock going down, right? We don't like their sound, and guitar music is on the way out. Beatles. Decca Records rejecting the Beatles, 1962, wow. and boy were they so. <laughs> and my personal favorite, 640K <laughs> on the <laughs> Who said that? Okay. <laughs> so you'll forgive me if I'm a little off too, right? Although you notice all these people underestimated what would happen in the future. They didn't overestimate. And that's what we tend to do. We tend to overestimate things that might happen next year, but we always underestimate what's going to happen in 20 years. Well, what I think is going to happen is that all of this uh, information about genetics is going to find its way into medicine, because we're going to travel down this big fat arrow here, and we're going to find the genes that are involved in virtually every disease. And that's going to then lead us into the ability to do diagnostics and preventive medicine, and something called pharmacogenomics, and gene therapy and drug therapy. Time is over there. You have to travel from top to bottom, and you don't just go there in one day. This is going to take years of hard work and lots of research, but that's where we're headed. So already, in fact, I can tell you we're getting there. For some conditions, we've gotten all the way to the bottom of this diagram. For others, we're still up near the top. The diagnostic part. This is a family in Baltimore that I know pretty well. They came to see us because two of the uh, family members had colon cancer in their 50s. And their mother had cancer of the uterus. And they're wondering, what's going on here? It's an awful lot of cancer in one family. Uh, a few years ago, I would not have had anything really to offer this family. We didn't know much about this. But now, looking at this pedigree, a geneticist would say, oh, boy, this is a family that ought to be investigated because they probably have a mistake in one of the genes that controls DNA mismatch repair, the spell checker that you have that's supposed to correct errors in your DNA if you happen to make them, is not working in this family. And sure enough, that was found out to be the case. Now, that doesn't necessarily have a huge impact on the people who are already affected. But there are other people in this family who don't have cancer. And you better believe they're wondering, are they going to get it? Are they next? What about her? She's wondering about uh, her situation, the brother and sister both affected. What about him? What about this daughter or this son and daughter over here? They're all at high risk. But we can now actually find out how high risk because we know what to look for. So this family went through genetic tests. By the way, they struggled with that a lot. They were worried about whether the information might get used against them. If they were found to be at high risk, would they lose their health insurance? Would they lose their jobs? So we actually did this in a fashion where they used assumed names to go through the test. This is kind of weird, isn't it? That something you want for your own medical benefit, you have to make up a name? We'll come back to that. And it turned out that three of these people have that glitch that places them at about a 60% chance of getting colon cancer. And uh, the woman here has about also a 20% chance of getting uterine cancer. But you know what? This is a situation where we have something to offer. Colon cancer is completely curable if you catch it while it's still small, a small polyp. And you can find those polyps these days using colonoscopy. So these three people got into a colonoscopy program. This guy has already been found to have a polyp. He got taken out of there. He's fine. But if we hadn't found it in another five or ten years, it would have been a cancer that would have probably spread to the rest of his body and killed him. So here's a circumstance where diagnosis is attached uh, to good prevention. And that's, that's a good thing. But we don't yet have that in some instances. Now what about pharmacogenomics? What's that? Well, we know that people who are given a drug for a particular condition don't always get better as a result. Sometimes the drug even seems to make people worse. What's that about? Well, it's partly about the fact that we are all different 
and our ability to handle certain drugs is also different, and that's often on the basis of our DNA. And here's a most dramatic example. Kids with leukemia, which is a terrible family crisis when it happens, but we do very well these days. 95% of kids with acute leukemia are cured with the chemotherapy that we give them. It's pretty brutal to go through it, but it cures 95%. But one out of 300 kids who goes through that protocol actually ends up getting very, very sick, and sometimes the therapy is itself even fatal. Now, why is that? Well, this drug called 6 mercaptopurine for some reason, is very toxic to one kid out of 300. Well, we now know why. It's because one kid out of 300 is missing the enzyme that's necessary for them to break that drug down. And so it doesn't get broken down. It builds up to very high levels. They end up in very bad shape. Well, we know how to test for that. So now no kid who has leukemia is given this drug without first having the test. And if they happen to be the one in 300, the drug dose is reduced and to about 10% of the usual level. They do fine. They still get cured of their leukemia. They don't get the toxicity. We are going to see this happening more and more for drugs. In fact, I would guess within five years, there will be standard of care drugs for common adult onset diseases where the physician will want to do a DNA test before they write the prescription. The therapeutic things down here are probably the most exciting. It's great to make predictions. It's better to engineer a cure. So how are we doing on that? Well, gene therapy, although it looks very easy here in this diagram, it's been a tremendous challenge, and I think there were some very over-optimistic projections made 10 years or so ago about how gene therapy was going to fix everything, and it was right around the corner, and that didn't happen. In fact, we even discovered that gene therapy could be dangerous uh, with the terrible, sad death uh, of an 18-year-old who was part of a gene therapy protocol as a volunteer. But I think we're recovering from that, and already just this year, you know, there have been virtual, actual cures <coughs> of a few individuals with inherited immune deficiency disorders, and clear advances in the treatment of hemophilia as well. Just the same, I think gene therapy, while it will find an important role, will probably not be as widely useful as this other approach, where you use what you know about the gene to figure out what kind of drug you should give to fix the problem. And the best example is this drug called Gleevec. Gleevec is a drug that was just approved by the FDA about a year ago. Uh, which is used to treat another type of leukemia. This is one that adults get, called chronic myeloid leukemia. Now, that disease we know a lot about, because people have been studying it for a couple decades. We know it comes about because of a mutation in a particular blood cell. It's actually a chromosome rearrangement. And that results in the production of a protein that transforms normal white cells into leukemic cells, and they just grow and grow and grow. And that's what leukemia is. And as a result, instead of what you should have in your peripheral blood, which is mostly red cells, these pale guys that you see there, you're just loaded up with all these white cells. That's what leukemia means, white blood, because your blood is so full of these malignant white cells. Well, it was reasoned by an uh, investigator uh, at uh, Oregon, Brian Drucker, that if he could come up with a drug that would block the active site of that protein, which is this little pocket here, which is a active site that binds ATP and uses it to transfer a phosphate to another protein, then maybe he could stop this process. So he uh, studied the uh, three-dimensional structure of this protein, and he built an organic chemical. So this is good organic chemistry synthesis in here that would fit right into that pocket with help from people at Novartis, a wonderful pharmaceutical company. And that's what Gleevec is. And it's a very simple idea, but it's incredibly powerful. Simply put a, a, a key in the lock here to block that, that site from doing the bad thing that it does. Now, this drug was given in the very first human trial to 32 patients with far advanced disease who were not expected to live more than a couple of months. And it was given at a fairly low dose just to see is this going to be toxic and do terrible things? Of those 32 patients who were effectively at death's door, 31 of them went into a remission and are still in. This is an incredible outcome uh, from, a, from a drug of this sort. That never happens. But this is, in fact, I think the paradigm for where we're going to be going for drug after drug based upon understanding what's going on. Up until now, our treatment for leukemia was very empirical and very toxic. Here's something that zeroes right in on the problem. That's where we want to go. And that's what happened. Well, you may say that's all fine. But what about all the other ways? 
that these advances in the understanding of the genome might get used. Curing a terrible disease, that's a great thing. But do we want to make designer babies? Have you all been to see Gattaca, the movie about uh, that kind of a society? Do you want to go there? What are we doing about that? Are we just going to let that happen and uh, oh well? Well, we, are, we have a new experiment. In the past, those kinds of ethical consequences of science have generally not received much attention until there was a crisis. Now, this time, Jim Watson, the original founder of the Genome Project, decided on day one that he would put a substantial fraction of the budget into studying these ethical, legal, and social issues in order to anticipate what needed to be done and try to get it done ahead of time. I, I think it's still an experiment in progress, but so far it looks as if this is a really good idea. Let's not wait for the crisis and then try to act. So out of that, we have had, I think, a remarkable cohort of bioethicists and lawyers and social scientists and theologians and others who have made a career out of trying to predict what these issues are going to be and propose options that would keep bad things from happening. And I think we've made remarkable progress, but we still have a ways to go. And many of the places we have a ways to go require the government to act. As a government employee myself, which still astounds me to say I'm a government employee, but I am I'm a federal scientist working for the National Institutes of Health. I can tell you, when I go down to the Congress, which I do uh, once or twice a week, it's very difficult to get people to act on something that's not a crisis. So this was a great idea, right? You do this sort of preventive legislation thing, except the system doesn't really like doing things that way. They generally respond when there is a lot of emotion and intensity. So we still need to fix a couple of things. And this is the most pressing one. Well, I already mentioned a couple of times, if you wanted to know your DNA sequence, that family with the colon cancer who are worried about knowing their DNA sequence, is that going to be used against you? Should it be? Is that just? Did you get to pick your DNA sequence? I don't think so. Should it be used to take away your health care? Your ability to be employed? That is unjust. It's unworkable, too, because remember, we're all flawed. If we start going down that pathway where that's a good reason to take away your health care, who's going to have health care? So we should decide right up front, take it off the table. That stuff doesn't belong in a health insurance company's decision-making process. And this has essentially now been agreed to by both parties, in both houses, and by the President of the United States. We need effective federal legislation. There are two really good bills in the Senate, one for the Republicans, one for the Democrats. If they could just sit down in the same room, for about a week, work out the little details, this could happen this year. But it isn't happening because there are other crises that seem to get more attention. This is very frustrating, as you can tell. If we don't take care of this, we are all going to, as the picture shows, get screwed. <laughs> and it will be all of us. So come on, Congress, let's do the right thing. Um, there's an educational issue here. You guys are high achievers. You're interested in science. You're going to learn this stuff. But many physicians who are out there in practice who have no genetics in their training are going to have to explain it uh, to the patients who come in the door wanting to know what they're at risk for. They're not ready. And most of the public is pretty confused about this as well. So we have a big educational challenge over the next four or five years if we're going to get ready for this revolution. Will this only be available to some people? Or will we figure out how to make this accessible to all, which it should be? Our medical care system in the US is woefully unfair in terms of who has access to medical care. Over 40 million people have no health insurance. We are the one civilized country that seems comfortable with that kind of situation. I hope all of you will sort of make a push to fix that, because it is disgraceful. What about this 0.1%? Will that study of that variation, which we want to do because it's going to be very important medically, uh, how will that be interpreted? Will people latch on to that? And how will they use that in social arguments? Well, I think there's a real opportunity here for this to be used for good, because that 0.1% is actually a reflection of the variation that existed in our common ancestors. So all of you are derived from a pool of about 10,000 people who lived in Africa about 100,000 years ago. And most of the variations that we see in the genome, the C or a T in one place or another, was already there in that group of 10,000 people. And it's still there in almost any part of the world you look. Now, there are some of those variations because of founder effects, or what we call drift, or perhaps even a new mutation, 
appear more commonly in one population than another. But that's the minority. That's more like 0.01%. So we ought to have an opportunity here to say science will not support an attitude of prejudice. Science will not support an attitude that says those people over there are biologically inferior. That will not be backed up by the facts. We already know that. And I hope we as scientists, when we have the opportunity, will make that case for those who would claim that such differences between groups, which are always the things that people want to focus on, uh, have biological meaning. They do not. I, there is no way to draw a sharp boundary around any group and say they're different than the rest of us. That's wrong. Science will not allow that. There, there's a cartoon here which I think uh, rather makes that point, uh, although it's a little bit painful cartoon given the current circumstances in the Middle East. But uh, it's very true. Arafat and Sharon. 99.99% the same because the variations, again, would have been in common. So it's really only 0.01% that they differ. And for that, what are we doing? Well, what about this limits question? This is the one that I think troubles people the most. Where, where is this going? Are we going to be willing to stop before we move on to using genetics to enhance the characteristics of the next generation? Are we going to slip into a mode where well-heeled couples who have the resources will design their offspring. Um, serious question. Now, most of the scenarios that people paint, whether it's the Gattaca movie or the latest thing in Parade magazine about designer babies, are, are not scientifically justified. Because if you were a yuppie couple and you wanted to design your characteristics of your kids, what would you pick? Well, you pick intelligence. You might pick athletic ability and certainly physical attractiveness, if this, anybody could agree with that one. Uh, you might pick uh, something like musical talent, um, those sorts of things. First of all, we have no idea what the gene, genetic contributions to those things are. There are genetic contributions. We'll find them in the next 10 or 15 years. Right now, we don't know. And even when we find them, they're only going to be about half the story because the rest of those things are heavily influenced by the environment, particularly something like intelligence or musical talent. Uh, and so a yuppie couple that puts in their order for a child who's going to be, you know, the quarterback on the football team and get A-plus in math and uh, play first violin in the school orchestra is likely to be very disappointed by a 16-year-old who is up in his room smoking pot and listening to heavy metal rock. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he has wonderful DNA. Uh, so that very well could happen. So, you know, the best way to get out of this mess about designer babies is that it just won't work. And people will decide it's a lot more fun to have babies the old way and the heck with this technology. <laughs> That's sort of what I think is most likely to happen. But not to make too much light of it, I do think we have a serious issue here where we have to, as a society, begin to engage on whether there should be limits when you're not talking about disease, but you're talking about traits. And who sets those limits? And how are they enforced? Again, uh, some of the uh, arguments I'm mentioning. Uh, Oh, here's Gattaca, just to remind you of that. If you haven't seen that movie, it's uh, an interesting one to rent. When I went to see it in the theater, there were about four people there, so I don't think a lot of people saw it in its first run, but it's still out there in the video store. A lot of the mistakes that I think we make about genetics are to over-interpret what DNA means, to ascribe to DNA more significance than it deserves. It's an incredible molecule. It does carry all the instructions for building from a biological perspective a human being. But it will not tell us very much about the human spirit. It won't tell us what love means. And it certainly won't explain to us our own hunger, uh, which is true of all societies, to find something outside of ourselves, something called God. And I actually uh, believe in God and find no controversy or conflict there at all between what I know as a scientist and what I believe as a person of faith. But some people are trying to take the tools of genetics and say, ah, oh, we don't need the spiritual worldview anymore because science has supplanted that. Don't buy into that. Science will not really shed much light on these questions. Science is not designed to study things outside the natural world. Well, this is a reminder of that. Occasionally, I've made the mistake of using the term the book of life to describe the human genome. I'm trying not to do that anymore after seeing this cartoon. <laughs> so let me quickly project for you what things might look like in medicine and in society over the next 20 years, and we'll do it in decades. So in 2010, 
I will predict that we will reach the point where if you want to know your individual risks for a dozen or so conditions, you can find out. For many of those, there will be interventions available. It won't just be have a nice day. It will be, here's the prescription of what you could do as far as diet and lifestyle and medical surveillance to reduce your risk of getting sick. That's a good thing. And this business where the doctor will want to know your DNA results before writing the prescription will be true for several drugs. But there will be controversies. Will access still be inequitable if we don't do something about it? Well, I sure hope we solve this discrimination issue long before 2010. Mindful again of all those people who made dumb predictions, I'm going to go to another uh, 10 years here. In 2020, I think the Gleevec example I told you about in terms of developing new drugs, that will have really kicked in in a huge way for virtually all diseases. So we will see things like diabetes and Alzheimer's treated with drugs that are really effective and have relatively few side effects because they go right at the problem. That will be wonderful and I can't wait. We will have gene therapy being used as the standard of care for some conditions, but I don't know which ones. And if you want to get your genome sequenced by then, it'll probably cost about $1,000. Right now, it costs about $100 million, so you got a lot of weight. <laughs> for $1,000, you'll probably just want to do it and keep it on a CD or somewhere uh, to make sure that nobody else looks at it without your permission. But there will be issues, and I think the issues that will really be haunting us all the way along that will be particularly vigorous at that point will be the non-medical uses. So how are you all going to get ready for all this? We're counting on you. You are the scientists that are going to help us make these new discoveries, that are going to chart this new course of using this fundamental information in the genome to, uh, to reveal how human biology works, which is a fascinating scientific question in its own right, and to apply it to medicine in a way that will be of great benefit to everybody. I mean, what, what could be more exciting than that? But at the same time, I think all of you have to also engage on the societal questions. The day where scientists went in their lab and closed the door and said, oh, that's somebody else's problem, has passed. And certainly in this field, I think all scientists will carry with them from this day forward an obligation to be out there, not necessarily telling everybody what's right and wrong. The scientists don't have the corner on the market on moral behavior. What we do have is information, information about what the real issues are, information about what's possible and what isn't possible. So that is what we should be prepared for. Now, if I can leave you with a quotation, and then we'll take some questions. It's not a quotation from a scientist. It's a quotation from an athlete. Because I think he put into words better than anybody I've ever heard what it means to be sort of ready for the future. This was the great one, Wayne Gretzky. So he was asked, you know, Wayne, how is it that you are always so much better than everybody else on the ice, and you're always the one who gets the goal? He said it very simple. I skate where the puck is going to be. Not a bad motto. Skate where the puck is going. Thank you all very much. Turn into dead. <laughs> so, so the question is, in an episode of Star Trek, <laughs> there was a uh, obviously fanciful but compelling story where the introns, which are the parts of the gene that get spliced out before you make what's called a message, which then uh, codes for the protein, the introns weren't getting spliced out anymore. They were actually getting used. And in Star Trek, that made everybody sort of revert back to being lizards and other slimy things that crawled on the ground. Well, is that realistic? Well, no, uh, because the introns are basically filler. You can sometimes have another gene hidden within the intron, but they really do have to get spliced out. Otherwise, the protein that you make will be total gibberish, and usually it will just stop prematurely. 
So a mutation that caused you to stop recognizing introns would be immediately lethal. Now, they had a little bit of a cute twist here in that when you look at genomes, we are similar, all the way down to bacteria. Some of our genes you can recognize have homologs in bacteria, and you certainly, in the mouse, most of our genes have uh, similar genes in the mouse that you can recognize. But it's the coding region you can recognize. The introns have diverged rather dramatically, implying that they're not under much selection and they probably aren't doing anything that makes you a lizard or a chicken or a human being. So it was a cool idea, but biologically, it didn't cut it. They didn't get enough good science advice. <laughs> yeah? Um, you stated that uh, males are twice as likely to have mutations. Are you worried about that? No. <laughs> I'm kind of proud of it. <laughs> it is a white chromosome speaking. <laughs> How do you know that? How do we know that? Oh, it's a good question. How do we know that males make mistakes more often than females? How would you discern that from, from reading the sequence of the human genome? That's a pretty tough question. Well, the way we did it, I didn't actually expect we were going to be able to do this. We sequenced all the chromosomes, which means we also sequenced the Y. The Y chromosome only gets passed from father to son. A Y chromosome never travels through a female. So the Y chromosome basically tells you the mutation rate, the clock for mistakes that males make, because it's the only way that it gets passed from generation to generation. Whereas the X chromosome sometimes goes through males, but twice as often it goes through a female. And the other chromosomes, 1 through 22, are 50-50. Now it turns out that there are some of these repeated elements that landed in the genome about 100 million years ago and have been under no selection since then. They've been gradually diverging. But you can see how far they've diverged from what they were to begin with. When you look at the ones on the Y chromosome, they're twice as diverged than the ones on 1 through 22. And so you can do the calculation, and bingo, it comes out. Male mistakes twice as often. Sorry, I don't make the rules. That's just the answer. Yeah. Um, I have a question about gene therapy. Does gene therapy actually constitute altering one's own genome, and it's not what exactly is going on? So what's the deal with gene therapy? Well, there's two types of gene therapy, one of which we have been trying to do, and one of which I think we probably should not try to do. The one we've been trying to do is somatic cell gene therapy, which is to say you alter the DNA of perhaps the tissue where you want to fix something. So if it's hemophilia, well, you want to fix the cells that make factor eight or factor nine. If it's this immune deficiency disorder, you want to fix the immune cells. But you're not changing the DNA that's going to get passed to the next generation. That would be called germline gene therapy. There are very few situations that I know of where you need to do germline gene therapy, where it even makes sense. And there are all kinds of reasons why we shouldn't try it right now, because it clearly wouldn't be safe. We would not know what we were doing. We don't know how to go in and fix one letter in the germline, change a T to a C, and do nothing else. So all of the things we do in gene therapy are actually much cruder than that. They might stick in a normal gene, but the other one is still there. And the normal gene might have gone in somewhere and done some damage. And so while we tolerate that in terms of the ethics for somatic cell gene therapy, we don't tolerate it when it comes to the possibility of passing that on to some future generation. So I think that's probably the way it's going to be for quite some time. So when you hear about gene therapy, it is not the kind that the next generation will be affected by. It's just for that person. That's it? Yeah. Uh, you stated that uh, junk DNA may have some interesting uses. Can yeah. you elaborate on that? So the question is about junk DNA and what uses it may have. You know, I don't really know the answer, but the, the information suggests that there must be one. Let me explain what I mean. If you look at the most common repeat, the thing that well, we most frequently refer to as junk. This is a little short stretch of about 300 letters of DNA that occurs in your genome and mine about a half a million times. This one repeat is about 20% of our genome. I mean, it's an incredible amount of the stuff. And we've always been annoyed by it and felt that it was completely um, unforgivable and it shouldn't be there. But when you look at what's happened over the course of the last 30 or 40 million years, those things are jumping around. And it turns out that when they land near a gene, a gene that's important, those are the ones you think that you'd want to get rid of as quickly as possible. Those are the ones that are held on to. If one of these lands somewhere in a desert where there aren't any genes, it gradually gets weeded out, gets lost. 
But if it lands right in the busy neighborhoods where all the genes are, the repeat stays there, which tells you that it is doing some good, or it would have gotten lost. So I don't know what it's doing that's good. I just know there must be some positive function that it provides. And this opened a whole new area of research that people are now trying to understand. And maybe in a few years we'll know. Right now I don't. Yeah. Um, type 2 diabetes is strongly influenced by environment, right? Both environment and genetics. It's one of these sort of tendencies, right? So in the future, if you had a patient that had genes that would predispose them to type 2 diabetes, when would you say, okay, diet and lifestyle won't be enough, and we're going to put you on designer based gene or gene based designer drugs, or you know, you're not? That's a great question. So the question is about type 2 diabetes or adult onset diabetes. How many of you have a family member with diabetes? I see a lot of people. Six percent of us will get diabetes. So some of you in this room will get diabetes unless we figure out how to cure it before you get it. Uh, and here is a condition where we know that it tends to run in families, but the inheritance is very complicated. It's certainly not recessive or dominant. There are many genes involved, and they're all kind of weak in their contribution. But we're going to figure that out. This is what my own lab is working on right now, primarily, is, is type 2 diabetes. We already have three genes that we're pretty confident are contributing, and there are probably another dozen. So perhaps in another five, six years, we'll be able to say who's at highest risk. So what do you do if you're at risk? Well, already we have learned, because there's a big environmental contribution, particularly from diet and particularly from gaining weight. There's just been a big trial to show that people who are sort of on the borderline of diabetes, have so-called pre-diabetes, if they get into an exercise program and walk 30 minutes three times a week, their likelihood of getting diabetes drops by a factor of five over the course of the next three or four years. So a simple measure, like getting some people to exercise, has a profound effect. That's really good news. But now some people will go on to get diabetes anyway, in which case you will then want to give them a drug that really works. And the drugs we have right now, they're okay. Insulin, of course, uh, is okay, but it doesn't really prevent the long-term complications. And so we will need to have better drugs for the people for whom simple measures like exercise and diet, losing a little weight, are insufficient uh, to cure the disease. All of these things sort of have to go hand in hand. So I think there's reason to be pretty optimistic that in 10 or 20 years, diabetes will be a lot less common, unless we really screw up. Over here, in the back. Yeah. So will we figure out how to design babies to prevent genetic disorders? Um, I think it's going to be pretty hard to do that. Uh, when you think about what would be involved, if you're talking about a recessive disorder, say like Tay-Sachs disease or sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis, in order to actually reduce the frequency of those diseases very significantly, you would have to go out and find the roughly 1 in 30 people who carries those and alter their germline. This would be a huge undertaking because most of the mutations for those diseases are not in the people with the disease. They're in the carriers. The carriers are vastly more numerous. So it's hard to come up with a strategy where that kind of approach would have much benefit over the course of time. Now, what people are doing, and you all would probably be uh, split a bit in terms of your opinion about this. Uh, there is a technique of pre-implantation diagnosis. Anybody heard of that? Let me tell you how this works. So this is in vitro fertilization. Let's say you have a couple who both carry a Tay-Sachs disease mutation. That means there's a one in four chance that a child of theirs is going to have this terrible disease. Will be born looking okay. By two years old, will be blind. By four years old, will be dead. So they have one in four chance. You could do an in vitro fertilization, and from that you often get a number of embryos that grow up to about the eight cell stage. You can actually take a little pipette and take off one of those eight cells without damaging the other seven, and do a diagnosis using DNA testing on that one cell to figure out, does that embryo have a double dose of the Tay-Sachs mutation? And that's done, in fact. And then you only reimplant the embryos that are not going to be affected. Uh, that is being done for Tay-Sachs, for cystic fibrosis, for sickle cell disease, and a very short list of other conditions. But people are beginning to talk about, well, you know, maybe we should make this more broadly available. Maybe it should be available for sex selection. That doesn't sound so good to me. 
Maybe it should be available for adult onset diseases. That doesn't sound so good either, because by the time the person grows up, he may have something to offer. This gets into very complicated ethical territory that has a lot to do with how you feel about the significance of an eight-celled embryo, whether you see that as human life or not. And I'm sure in this room there's probably some divergent views on that. And basically, then, science doesn't help very much in resolving that. We can tell you scientifically what's possible, but we can't tell you what's right. And I think when I talked about setting limits on the application of genetic technology, I was actually thinking about this pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And do we want to have that applied increasingly for things that aren't like Tay-Sachs disease, but are more like, say, obesity uh, for a couple who doesn't want to have a child who's a little overweight? That makes me very uneasy. That really begins to create a situation where people are commodities. And you sort of order up the ones you want. And yet at the present time, there are no rules Yes, uh, with all the genetic research, what do you project life expectancy? Well, what will life expectancy be with all of this going on? I don't know, because I don't know on my graph there how rapidly uh, these things are going to come to pass. I would like to think that more people will be able to live out their four score and ten without being cut down prematurely by heart disease or cancer or some other dreadful illness. Uh, and we're getting there. You know that life expectancy in the U.S. goes up by one year every five years. And that's been the trend now for several decades. So if the life expectancy today is like 83, well, five years from now it'll be 84. Will we ever get to the point where it goes up by one year every year? <laughs> that nobody dies? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think the death rate will be one per person for most of us. Um, <laughs> but I do think if this all works, uh, that we should see a significant benefit to life expectancy, allowing more people to live to be 90 or 100 years old. Will we figure out how to extend the lifespan beyond that to sort of get out to 150? I have no idea. There are certainly people who believe that, who are working on trying to understand the genes involved in aging, because there are genes involved in aging. And already in things like mice and fruit flies, people have done experiments where they've extended the lifespan by about 40%, which for us would mean living to be 140. Uh, I don't think it's going to be so easy to do that in humans. And I think that's many, many, many years off. But it's not impossible to contemplate. And boy, would that disrupt society with everybody who's retired at 60 living for another 80 years. <laughs> I don't want to go to the economic consequences there. It wouldn't be pretty. Yes? Dr. Pollock, one more, one more question. One more question. I know that there's no other organisms such as math, like lower organisms. Yes. Do you think after the any of these technologies that you just can have the previous community on, on family pets, resources? I'm going to veterinary medicine, so I'm just wondering if it would cross over Sure. So the question is, will the study of genomes have an effect on veterinary medicine uh, for pets or horses? Absolutely. In fact, I think some of the most significant advances are going to be in that field, in part because there are fewer ethical concerns about the application. We are about to start sequencing the dog genome, and people are very interested in trying to figure out what makes a golden retriever friendly, what makes a Newfoundland want to go in the water, and all those things. And the racehorse people are crazy about this because they want to understand what makes a racehorse that wins a lot of races. And they may start to do a better job of predicting that if they have DNA. Uh, whether you think that's the most opportune use of this information is another question, but it's going to be in there. And yeah, I think veterinary medicine is going to be very significantly affected in the not too distant future. Probably initially for cats and dogs and horses, but cows aren't too far behind either. So yeah, yeah, it's going to be a big part of what you do. Well, now for the surprise, because <laughs> I know this has been a long day for you guys. They're all groaning like, oh my god, what is this? <laughs> well, I think at the end of a long day, we ought to have a little music. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, scientists have to do something to take their minds off things when the experiment failed 
uh, when you know somebody didn't do what they were supposed to, the funding didn't come through, the Congress was mad or whatever. So what I do is I take perfectly decent songs that you used to like, rewrite them a little bit. <laughs> So um, this one I wrote, but you'll recognize the tune, but not the words. Uh, at the time that we had finished this uh, sequence of the human genome, and it was all up there on the internet, and I had this dream about, am I doing that? <laughs> about one of those donors that had given their blood for this result, and was reading in the newspaper or watching on television, the sequence of the human genome has been determined was thinking to themselves, that might be me. <laughs> and then, you know, getting more curious, goes to that website I showed you and starts paging down through the DNA going, is that me? Is it okay? Is there something <laughs> wrong here? Well, this is the song about that person's experience. <laughs> As I walk along the bases in all three billion places upon my PC screen, am I built for strong endurance or loss of health insurance? Am I a mere machine? I'm a walking the genes don't know what all this means. No one else knows that it's me behind that GSP. And I wonder, help me here. Why, 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 girls or something. <laughs> There's a part here that goes, we really got the code on you. We really got the code on you. And you got to come in as an echo when you hear that. All right. You ready for this? Okay. You look very promising. <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> Got 
got you now. You can't stop us now. We really got the code on you. We really got the code on you. We really got the code on you. We really got the code on you, baby. <laughs> Hold on. Watson and Crick, they were the first to see that A pairs with P and C pairs with G, but oh, 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 we really got you now. You can't stop us now. We really got the code on you. 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 Baby, I love you. And all I want to do is just read you. Read you. Read you. Read you. Read you. But now we know you, just want to know you, don't want to own you. Oh, 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 we really got you now, you can't stop us now. We really got the code on you, 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 we really the code on you. baby. It'll come in a minute, okay, hang on. Yeah, it's a gift for every race and gender. Ours is free, but not the one for Fenter. <laughs> oh, we really got the code on you. 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 Baby, I love you. And all I want to do is just read you, read you, read you. Read you. Genome. <laughs> Genome. <laughs> experience that all of you are about to go into. You'll love it, but there will be some aspects of it that make you crazy. Since I've been a college teacher, I can uh, relate to that. I've also been a college student. It seemed to me that the college experience was not necessarily designed for the benefit of the college students, but for other forces in the universe. <laughs> So this is a song from the perspective of the student, although the last verse is my perspective as a professor. <laughs> I came, I bought the books, lived in the dorms, followed directions. I worked, I studied hard, made lots of friends that had connections. <laughs> I crammed, they gave me grades, and may I say, not in a fair way, <laughs> but more, much more than this, I did it their way. I learned so many things, although I know I'll never use them. <laughs> The courses that I took were all required. I didn't choose them. <laughs> You'll find that to survive, it's best to play the doctrinaire way. And so I knuckled down and did it there. <laughs> well, yes, there were times I wondered why I had to cringe when I could fly. I had my doubts, but after all, I clipped my wings and learned to crawl. <laughs> I learned to bend, and in the end, I did it there. <laughs> and 
now my fine young friends now that I am a full professor <laughs> once I was oppressed I have now become the cruel oppressor <laughs> With me, I hope you'll see the double he licks is a highway, and yes, to learn its best than to win mine. <laughs> I'm just a man, what can I do? Open your books, read chapter two, and if it seems a bit routine, don't talk to me, go see the Dean. <laughs>